let's begin. I'm going to introduce Bobby, and, and then we'll just go down the panel, because nobody speaks better about themselves than, than themselves, because let's face it, if you're an investor, you're a narcissist. So there you go. Very true. So Bobby. <laughs> can you hear me okay? I think they can hear me okay. Hi, I'm, uh, thanks, Jonathan. No problem. Um, you, buddy. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so I'm Bobby Ocampo with Revolution. We're a venture and growth equity firm here in DC. We're founded by Steve Case and Ted Leontis, a handful of others you probably know better than me. Um, we're investing out of two funds. Our growth fund's 450 million doing growth equity. Um, some of the local companies you've probably heard of that they're invested in are Sweetgreen, Custom Inc, and companies like that. Uh, I'm on the Ventures team. We're investing out of our $200 million fund, which we raised last year. Looks like I should hold it. <laughs> I don't know. No, I think okay. I'm Jake Tarr. I'm with uh, Kinetic Ventures. We're an early stage venture fund. We operate out of two offices, one in Chevy Chase, Maryland, the other in Atlanta, Georgia. We're investing out of our ninth fund. We like to invest in the first institutional round. Um, software and communications focus primarily. Tien introduced me to a few people this morning and said, we're the uh, institutionalized investor. I wasn't sure what he meant by that. Uh, hi, I'm Jason. I'm Jason Shrensky, uh, local angel investor. Uh, do a lot of work with the Dingman Center uh, Angel Group and also Next Gen Angels. Uh, also an entrepreneur. I uh, have a company that's uh, kind of being born now called Complex Interests uh, in the wealth management area, doing visualizations of complex financial relationships. Cool. Uh, I'm Paul Singh, and I'm proud to say I'm a blood-sucking venture capitalist, but uh, uh, I'm a person too, just so you know. Um, so it likes blood, right? <laughs> there was this weird pause for just a second there. Um, uh, so, so I'm the founder and CEO of Disruption Corporation. Uh, we are uh, a registered investment advisor, but I think the more sexy way to say it is that um, over the last eight years or five years, I've raised eight venture funds, um, invested in about 900 companies now. Um, some notable national ones, I guess, are things like MakerBot and Twilio. Some of the notable local ones, things like Social Tables and, and Contactually. Um, I guess I'm blood sucking capitalist. I'm probably the most aggressive early stage investor, I think, on the planet. But, but that's not the way I see you. I, I mean, so actually, what I see, and, and, and what I want to tease out is, what I see is four guys that, that have been spending a lot of time figuring out how to make this new world work right uh, in different ways. So let's just start there. If we were doing this panel five years ago, it would look very different, sort of traditional Raise your angel, maybe it's 10 years now. Raise your angel, do your series A, B, sort of this conveyor belt idea of, of funding. Well, it'd also be a bunch of white guys that are super old. <laughs> so, it's like super, I guess there's a lot of, <laughs> what, yeah, well, a lot it, of guys that are, a lot, uh, that are usually old. That's true, right? It is true. Uh, and the the okay. industry is, has been for a long time yeah. been very much the preserve uh, of the guys that make the rules. I think that's true, and that's breaking down. So let's talk about that, Paul. It is breaking down. Why is it breaking down, and how is it breaking down in D.C., and why is that good for entrepreneurs? Well, I guess I would first say that, like, you know, rather than bring the conversation back to D.C., which I think is a sexy thing people locally do, I think it's important to just first understand that the problems or the challenges in D.C. are no worse than anywhere else, right? So in other words, a founder in Tulsa has actually the same problems as a founder in D.C., which frankly has the same problems as a founder in New York. Now, that being said, uh, five years ago, you know, the big change, right? So 15 years ago when I started my first company, you needed a million bucks. Let's just, just pick a round number. A million bucks to start because you had to buy servers and you had to put them in a data center. You had to actually connect a wire that had the internet in it to the back of it. And then um, everything dropped. 2002, we had open source software. So now you needed 100,000 bucks to start. And then 2007, we had Amazon Cloud, Rackspace Cloud. It cost 10,000 bucks to start. And now, really, it's your laptop. And so the point is that it became easier for most people to start technology companies. This doesn't apply to things like biotech and pharma and hardware just yet. But even those barriers are breaking down. The point is it got easier for people to start companies. And as those costs came down, it became easier for angels to come into play. And it actually, it became easier for funds to become smaller, venture funds to become smaller as well. And so the world's changed. I'll, I'll just end that part of the statement by saying that I believe the private market today looks like the public market of 20 years ago. And if you don't believe me, I'll just point out that AngelList, which disclaimer, I'm an investor in, um, AngelList bought a full page ad in The Economist earlier this week advertising AngelList funds. 
right next to a Porsche ad, right next to a Fidelity Mutual ad. Right? So the point is, though, is that everything's changing now. And if the last five years was the rise of the angels and the micro VCs, then the next five years is about the professionalization of this entire asset class. It'll be really fascinating to see how it works. What do you guys think of that? That was really unsexy and boring. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, I think it's probably a great place to start. I mean, look, we can start. What are you looking for in investment? And maybe we should do a little bit of that. But, but seriously, what you just described, there are a number of things in there that are particularly revolutionary or out there. Some the idea, for example, that that venture and angel is is where the public markets were 20 years ago. I mean, I, have, I don't hear that from everybody. Well. Let's just point out, by the way, that um, you guys remember, by the way, that in the 1990s and prior, that the New York Stock Exchange used to shut down on Wednesdays. Did anybody remember that? Why was that? Bagel time. Well, maybe. But it was also because the <laughs> trades were on paper, right? The back office had to catch up. What most people don't realize is the private market took that turn from paper to electronic last year. This is public info but you probably shouldn't tweet it anyway, is that AngelList has already transacted $500 million between angels, uh, private investors and companies. About 85 million of that has come through AngelList syndicates. Most of that's electronic. The point is, the private market has already taken the turn from paper to electronic. It's only gonna increase in speed now. And it, by the way, AngelList is a team of 22. Fascinating. So I'm not sure I agree with all that. What about you guys? I well, I, I, think, well, I think it's threat. I mean, as an angel Seriously. investor, it's it's a it's a it's a tough story, right, to swallow. I mean, as an you know, when you think of a traditional angel investor, typically it's a person who's had some success in a entrepreneurial venture on their own or otherwise, and now they want to be involved in companies and, and, and in a kind of in a light way, of being an investor. And um, if there was this professionalism of this asset class, if we thought about it that way, then the traditional the way we think of angel investors will will die, right? I mean, they, they would. Is that, that bad, uh, though? Is that bad? Well, it would be bad for me. I wouldn't want to die. <laughs> uh, well, but, but on the, the flip side of that coin is you have access to the same deals now that a traditional fund does, whereas before, you as an angel had to pay the, the management fee to a VC. It's good for you, actually. Well, I, I think it's good if you look at this as an asset class. And I Which think we that, should. Well, you can, but I don't think you necessarily should. I think that's actually a little bit opposite of the way many angel investors function. And that's you know, probably why they lose so much money. Well, they, they may, but I, well, think, I, I, I don't think it's well, proven yet that, that these I, angel funds are like killing it. I think people, a lot right? of people I mean, lose that's money in an efficient market as well. So, yeah. Now, let me bring my, my two buddies who are in the VC industry. We're not buddies? Uh, you are all, well, my other two buddies. <laughs> That's a fuck, no. man. Hey. Oh, oh, number one. OK. <laughs> What's You're your welcome. Primary? Thank you. We're splitting the fee. All right, well. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? You know, is, is, isn't there still room for uh, an institutionalized approach or uh, a bespoke approach to funding companies? Oh, well, I really appreciated Paul's view of kind of how this phenomenon has, has unfolded in the last few years, because um, I've been in the venture space for 27 years, and I would say that the phenomenon that really fascinates me is the explosion of angel funding. That, that's, a, that's a very different scenario than was the case uh, even five years ago, but for sure 10 years ago. Um, but the challenge, I think, uh, has not changed for the entrepreneur uh, in terms of getting institutional funding beyond the angel funding. There's a plethora, everybody, for the reasons you said, everyone can be an entrepreneur today, and many, many are, and there's lots of social trends explaining why that's true. But what's happening on the VC side is a wicked winnowing yes. of all those mm -hmm. angel funded companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very difficult to get an A round and even more difficult to get a B round for all those companies that get funded. So I think it's a really fascinating time to see what happens to all those companies with early stage bright yeah. prospects. I mean, it's just, yeah. just to like echo that, I'd say it's easier than ever to raise your first half million bucks. It's easier than ever to raise your last 50 million. It really that's fucking right. sucks in the middle. That's, that's exactly right. right. That's exactly Two, right. By the way. Yeah, that's good. You know, my <laughs> over under, I'm not going to say where mine is. Um, Whoever wins, I'm taking half the prize money, by the way. Yeah. Well, but, but the problem is, is if you know, you're going to skew the outcome. 
But isn't that what VCs do? I heard do? it was 12. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> drive them off the edge. But you guys, it, it, it's exactly what uh, is going on right now, is that there is, uh, a lot of ways, the market is becoming what an, I, as an economist or a trader, would call a very perfect market. You know, not a lot of barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're on the early stages, and Paul and I were talking about this uh, earlier, is that, and uh, Jake and I were, you know, if, if, you can't, if you can't get your company to revenue with, with if, if you're in software, you know, or software yeah. as a service, something like that. If you can't get your business to revenue with the money you raise from your friends and family these days, you probably shouldn't do your business because the reality is, is that software is becoming a, a commodity. What's not a commodity is execution. So that means the market's really efficient to the low end because a lot of money can now cluster and use the internet. And money's clustered at the, at the back end because the big funds need momentum. They're looking for the next Uber. You know, they're looking for the next, the next big thing they can do a quick flip on. And, and there's this void in the middle. That basically, that's the battleground of what's the future of the industry. Yep. You know, and, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. Because, now, it's interesting. I'll just say, putting my professor head on for a moment, that a number of academics have done studies and, and, uh, and, and shown that there's a correlation between when professional investors get involved with first-time entrepreneurs, they're more likely to, to have a, an exit. Now, you could argue that's, that's because of the selection bias and so forth, but I'm not sure that I would say that the VC industry as it's currently constituted is, and, and angels as traditionally done don't, don't have a role. Ultimately, hey, Bobby, I, let me ask you this. What's the, isn't the, isn't the customer in this finance and traction ultimately, uh, finance and transaction ultimately the entrepreneur? Totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, people differentiate like big funds out in the valley and not us. I mean, maybe Paul and, and maybe Jake here will, but we don't have billions of under management and tens of millions in fees to support a talent HR function or a, a CFO function or whatever, where you can go to us and we'll you can outsource anything you want to us. And mm -hmm. we just don't have the fees to support that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think in the end, you know, you're seeing a lot of, especially today, um, whereas before, you know, you found that, um, I think, companies would chase after VCs and then maybe 10, 10 years ago, sort of in the middle now, I mean, for us, for me, I mean, every really interesting company that we try to find, I, our CAC, Right, our customer acquisition cost of acquiring that entrepreneur is so much higher than it was before because the very best companies do not need us. Mm -hmm. They don't. They are bootstrapped, cash flow positive, growing 100, 200, 500 percent over year over year on a base of million millions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't need capital, so you have to convince them. You have to figure out if you're a good fit for them, and vice versa, right? So it requires us not. And, and to Paul's point, where it's so easy to start a company now. It, but it's even more expensive to scale it. There's just yeah. so much more noise. Yeah. So, but now for us, when we're trying to find these really good nuggets in XYZ part of the country, we're flying out there 5, 10, 15 times over the course of a year, right? Mm -hmm. So we think for us, our differentiators trying to serve these underserved ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're looking to fund the next hot thing in the valley and it's great and you can do an angelist, great, and you don't want that con much control over your cash, by all means, right? Go for it, it's great. And you can argue their deal flow is probably as good, if not better or, or worse than ours, but we tend to view the world a little, little differently. And I think that's how Paul and Jake and Jason, we, we find those, uh, that sort of strategy to be differentiated and hopefully our LPs buy into something like that and, and when they invest in all of us. I mean, could we be basically heading towards a world where certain entrepreneurs don't need anything other than money? I mean, either because they don't need anything other than money or they think they don't. And another group of entrepreneurs that think they do. Uh, here's the phenomena that I, I think we don't know the full answer to yet, and that is uh, companies get started for very little capital. They, they start growing, and they're showing the 100% or 200% growth, and uh, there's a handful of funds, maybe 20 or 25, who are making really big bets really early. And they're, they're declaring the winner much earlier than was historically the case which does a couple of things. One, to do that, they've got to be willing to put a high value on that business. So every other company in the space thinks they ought to get the same value, and there, there's issues with that. But secondly, it makes it more difficult for that entrepreneur who didn't get that big valuation uh, to draw capital, because everyone wants to know, how are you going to compete with that company that just raised $200 million? But we don't know if all those are going to be successful. So. The challenge is for those companies who didn't get the big money to figure out a path to be successful. 
uh, because I, I, I don't think that we know that that model is a, a lasting model. But it, but it is definitely something that, that is very coloring startup formation here. And, and I think what happens, and I've seen it happen a fair number to startups here in DC, is, uh, oh, I've got this idea, you know, and I've got the angel money, and then, you know, a company out in the valley pursuing the same kind of business suddenly raises a 10 or $20 million round. And it's almost like it's, it's too late or impossible to imagine that the local or the second place company catching up. Is that really what's going on in the markets now? Is it that, is it that tough? Well, you know, in an increasingly crowded market, to, to Bobby's point, um, look, it's really more about distribution today. How, how do you get in front? I mean, I think, you know, so many founders, um, uh, I can't remember who said this the other day, but, you know, the point is, like, so many founders worry about their competitors as if it's a fight when it's actually a race. Mm -hmm. It's not a fight. It's a race. And if you're going to go raise outside money, you need to understand it's not to pick a bigger fight. It's to run a faster race. I think that's what founders don't understand. That's a really good point. I think the other thing founders don't understand is that five years ago, to your original question about five years ago, how's it different? Five or ten years ago, you just had to be the best company in your sector within, I don't know, 250 miles, because the chances were low that 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 you know your investors, you know, whether you know, I'm speaking generally, which is dangerous, but. Chances were low that your, your investors had knowledge or even access to some of the other competitors that were outside that circle. Today, you have to understand that like you're up against not only the best founders in your space in this country, but you're up against the best founders in your space globally. Like just, just to put it into context, this country has built the largest internet companies in the world, with a little asterisk, with Alibaba. But over the last 20 years, we've done that, right? We've, we've seen it grow our GDP. We've seen a lot of benefits of it, right? We did that because we had the most monetizable middle class online, all that, over the last 10 years. That middle class, that actually, the country as a whole, let's just use big numbers. That country as a whole, this country is about 350 million people. Mm -hmm. To put that into context, there are more than that number of children in the Indian school system right now. Right? Yeah. Brazil's middle class is way growing way faster than ours. China, just Alibaba, that's all I'm going to say, Alibaba. Or Tencent. Or yeah. Tencent. Yeah. So the yeah. point is, though, is I don't mean to scare you, but rather that you must understand that like investors' jobs, especially like, so by the way, does everybody know the difference between an angel and a VC? Not a trick question. What is the, what is the difference? An angel's, an angel's investing his own money. That's yes. what I think. Or right. her own money. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but right. but yeah. the, um, that's the difference. Now, now there's an important implication there. So when he's investing his own, it is your own money, like your angel. He's a heavy angel. So, so the, here's the difference. You, if you, he can invest because he likes the color of your shoes. He can invest for any reason. He can invest because he likes you. He can invest because the sky's blue. Do mm -hmm. anything he wants. The rest of us that have funds, I know you've got a okay. traditional fund vehicle, fund vehicle as well. Yep. The difference is that we have what's called fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. That's right. Here's your little pro tip. If you find out that you're talking to an investor, a VC, a fund, don't talk about fucking changing the world. Don't talk about like, you know, like, hey, I want to like go beat this little kid over here or whatever. You talk about fiduciary. You understand that our job is to make money. That's right. You have to oh, appeal yeah. to our group. Yeah. Totally Although good. having said that, um, I do think that uh, an entrepreneur who is motivated and, and has the passion uh, is really important because, as we all know, and I'm sure many of you know because you live in it, entrepreneurship often sucks. I mean, it's really, really hard. Yeah. You know, Don Rainey, who's a friend of, of mine and many of us know well, describes entrepreneurship as the following way. You go home, and on your way home, you think your life poss could never possibly be worse than it is at that moment in time. And then you wake up the following morning and realize that the night before you were wrong. And or, or you wake up and you realize you've burned all your VCs money, not your money. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's, it's like five days of glamour and 360 days of shit. Right. So, so the one caveat I would say is, is that um, having made investments on my own and also managing money for a bunch of wealthy families as a fiduciary and being a, a former lawyer, knowing the, the, the difference, I can tell you that I've never invested or done business with somebody who didn't have an unbelievable amount of energy and commitment and, and passion that changed the world idea, right? But it doesn't matter that if I'm, if I'm acting on behalf of somebody else's money, my liking the entrepreneur is highly irrelevant. I, I don't disagree. It's just that now with entrepreneurship being more accessible, too many people say they want to change the world without yeah. actually, that's the problem. 
That's why I would also say... It's like killing it. Yeah, they're killing it. Like, right. I would also say, if you call yourself a startup, you're f***ing. Because, like, there's too many of them. There's too many of them, right? What should they call themselves? Well, if we're being, like, economic development people, I would say, look, there's no difference between you and the ice cream shop down the, store, uh, down the street. You are a tech-enabled, high-growth business. That's what you are. By the way, if you want to understand why politicians don't give a shit about startups or why nobody gives a shit about startups, because most fail, and most of them, now that it's been Hollywoodized, are people that are like doing lean canvases on a fucking whiteboard <laughs> and pretending like it's going to become like this $200 billion business. I, I want to jump in here and yeah, just, um, we're certainly a fiduciary and we take our fiduciary responsibilities very seriously. Um, but that's not in the forefront of my mind okay. when I'm sitting in front of an entrepreneur. Uh, what, what we know from our experience over, we're on our ninth fund, is that, and, and we wish this weren't true, but about 70% of the investments we're going to make are really not going to work out well. Right. They're just not. Uh, and what we also know through our experience is that one or two investments per fund are going to make all the difference. And that's just the math, not just for us, for pretty much everybody up here on the, mm -hmm. on the panel. So when we're listening to an entrepreneur, we're asking ourselves the question, do we think this idea, and really not the idea, but the market is significant enough that we believe that this, then this entrepreneur can have a success significant enough that it will return our entire fund? Yeah. That's right. We have that's what we have to believe and and that's when we get engaged and we get excited. If 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 it looks like it's gonna be a nice company, we're gonna earn two or three times our money, that's great if that's what happens on the back end. But if we believe that on the front end, we're probably not going to invest. Right. I mean, you don't. Inv I don't know anybody who's ever invested thinking, well, oh, well, maybe this will be a, a, a two bagger. I mean, you, you've got to because you never know. I, I'm always amazed by this, having been in this for a long time, that in any six month window, you know, the, the problem child and the star can it just it's flops. It's amazing. Uh, but it all to me, and this is to, to my point to Paul, it all comes back to the entrepreneur for me, how resilient they are. I mean, I've seen companies that are just dead, dead, dead rise from the ashes. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, that, the, the, the business of investing has changed, right? I mean, I think, just to your, to your point, I would just say that um, um, there's so many companies now that are good companies but may not be venture style. Yeah. That, like, I, I don't know how to articulate this any better than just saying that I think it's important that people start to think about, you know, when you think about all the things you have to think about, uh, product, market fit, yada, 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 you also have to start thinking about where your capital is going to come from. and. Um, like we turned down a company uh, two weeks ago that was um, doing 30 million a year gross revenue, seven employees, really great business, right? Until you put it into the context of the bigger picture because their competitors are so far ahead of them into the billions that like they will make a lot of money, but it won't be venture style. I just, we can't see a path towards it becoming a big ass company that will return, that has a possibility of returning our entire fund. Um, so anyway, the point I was just making in a poor way there is, is learn venture economics. If not because you need to like speak to the investors in a way that they understand, but if just so that you can understand why you might be getting a no, right? Because again, it's not that you might, you may not be that you have a bad business. So with this market that we're now in, where would we, where, where would you recommend uh, uh, our region entrepreneurs to focus? Where, where are the opportunities here to create differentiable businesses that are ahead or could be ahead? Plastics, no. What do you guys think? Well, I, I think you have to do yeah. what you know. Yeah. But you, yeah, you got to come out with somewhere where, you've had ex where you have experience. I mean, don't just say that I have an idea. It yeah. should be, I worked in X industry for some period of time, I saw a problem, and I'm uniquely situated to solve that problem. That's the, that's the story that is always going to, to resonate and, and feel real. Or even if you didn't, um, you're at, you've been at it for a year or two, and you're showing that yeah. you're... I and mean, for us, how, how, how do we uh, evaluate our flow? Um, we try to, uh, you know, Paul's got a scientific approach to it, but ours is a little more old school. Um, we'll probably meet with folks for two, three, four, five years and collect data points throughout that entire time. And if you execute on the plan you told us you're going to execute on, it makes it very easy for us to invest. 
Now, if you keep coming back to us and you keep saying, oh, we're, we're almost at that million dollar run rate, we're almost at the five million dollar run rate, it's been going for five years, you've had that conversation with every VC, um, it makes it easy for us to say, hey, you, you didn't hit on what you said, you're, or you were, we're not gonna hit on what you said you were gonna hit. And um, that, that's, that's probably the number one sign we look for. So you guys don't buy this, this meme that floats around that if you wanna do certain type of companies, you've gotta leave here and go to Silicon Valley, for example. I prefer you staying in some a hole that no one else knows about but us. Yeah. Yeah. I, honestly, like I, that would be Cleveland, not Washington. Anywhere. I mean, but, we. But I, that's ideal for you, but not necessarily ideal for the company. Well, if they're growing fast or doing well, well I mean, stay in the well, hole, you know, right? right? But don't go to the uh, wherever, right? Well, I, I don't I'm know. an investor in an ad tech company. Is it? Yeah. Is this yeah. me? Oh, yeah. There you go. Keep, keep electronics away from you, man. Yeah, You're right. dangerous. But, I, but I'm an investor in an ad tech company, and uh, being in New York versus here has been helpful. I mean, it, it, it just it just is just the nature of it. Yeah. And that CEO is great. I mean, yeah. we, we all tracked him for a long time. He's doing well. Um, I, I, but I agree, it was helpful for him to go up there. But at the same time, it's, we, we've collected data points in for four years, three years now. Right. And it makes it really easy for any investor, I think, to want to back him. Right. Cool. So I wanted to leave a few minutes. Well, I was just going to add to the question of West Coast, East Coast, what should people in Washington be doing? Uh, I think it's a really good question because if you think about the last boom we had here, it was around infrastructure, telecom infrastructure. There were some very, very successful companies. Those companies today are valued at a tenth or less of what they were then. And what's the big wave that's happened since, we all know, is uh, the consumer internet uh, and consumer apps. And we have not, uh, as a region, been as successful at that as the West Coast has. And that's moved in a large way there. If there was a way for us to get better at that as investors and entrepreneurs, I think that'd be a big step forward. And I think we've always been good uh, on this coast, on the enterprise. So we should continue to focus on enterprise applications. So here comes a shameless plug. I don't know how many of you know that I'm running this program called Tandem NSI. I'm working with the national security agencies now to create more of an interconnect between our product entrepreneurs and the R&D departments of groups like DARPA and, and DHS and so forth for exactly what, what you described. I, I think that, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's, well, I, don't, I know $140 billion a year gets spent on R&D. And a lot of that, a lot of that gets spent um, uh, with entrepreneurs around the country. And I don't know whether you noticed that the Secretary of Defense two weeks ago got on a plane and flew to Silicon Valley and announced that the Pentagon wants entrepreneurs to work with them. And he didn't frickin' California, he didn't do it here. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to fix. You guys have any questions? We, you know, to start out. April, how are you? I'm good. I, so I have just a couple, thank you, by the way. Um, as, a, as an intermediary, I see a lot of companies who look like pretty nice companies and they're, you know, they're making money and they'll find their money. And so I introduce them to one or the other of you. And I, it, it never really, the bell had never rung. Jay, to go back to what, I just, this is really just a comment. I, I've been in the business now for almost 20 years and those are exactly the same numbers that the NBCA was putting out in 1995. That in 10 deals, you get seven that, yeah, probably maybe will return, but, you know, two, and then one that will return the, the fund. And so it's interesting, Paul, that although you, you know, I mean, I absolutely agree with you, but I see that this is this, you know, you get your first round, but getting an A round is just hell out of deals. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure getting the last 500 is all that is either, but I'll mm -hmm. take your word for it. But it's interesting that even though it changed, it's still the same. It's still, you have to believe that it's gonna pay back the fund, and, you probably, and it probably won't. So there's a, a really interesting, a piece that says, you know, how do you, so this is where my question is, how do you know that it's going to pay back the fund? Is it, Harry Weller one time said, they did a little study at NEA, you know, big market, little market, you know, they had roughly the same success rate, <coughs> so a big market was obviously a much better solution. Is that the answer? What, if you're, a, if you're coming to you, what are you looking for as, as, the, as, the, as the tenor? So how do you know if it's a winner? Yeah, how do you know if, it's, if it has the potential to be? Yeah, it's more the potential. You know, we, we certainly don't know. If we did, I wouldn't be on this stage today, for sure. Well, you're on your ninth fund, so That's right. well, you're some, not just lucky. Something's working, but we focus a lot on the market. We, we, we want to believe it's a big market. And, and often, if, if, if the, the market can be really well articulated, you're probably too late. 
right? So we're looking for somebody who can see a market and can really define it before everyone else does. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we get sold on that, once we want to get on that train, uh, then we look very carefully at the management team, uh, believe, we want to believe in those people and, and, and their solution. But what we also know is that a lot happens after we put our money in. Right? I mean, there's, it's a long way between when we invest and when success occurs. So it's just, a, you know, pattern recognition and ours is not perfect. But market, we've learned that markets are the most important thing to study. You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a, an academic called Clayton Christensen that some of you may run across. He, he talks about something called the innovator's dilemma. And he studies why it is that large companies can't innovate. And one of his big reasons why is because the reality is that most most disruptive innovations, when they start, have very small market. Is that it doesn't become obvious until much later. Paul, I mean, your company is all about disruption. Is that? You know, the irony of this industry is that we give money to people that we expect to be innovating, but as an industry, we haven't really. Right. We haven't really. I mean, look, we have the same, generally speaking, the same management structures, management fees. Now. Look, that's changing over time. Look, we're starting to see angels come up the stack, right? Like, if we, if we think about the traditional GP, the person that runs a fund, all of a sudden, you've got angels coming up the bottom of the stack, you've got private equity guys coming down the top of the stack, and now you've got banks, like Silicon Valley Bank, doing interesting funding ideas right in the middle of the stack. So the traditional GPs are uh, feeling pressure. Now, here's the thing. What I'm really saying is the business of venture capital um, is not about picking unicorns because you can't, mm -hmm. right? It's about picking the least worst opportunity in front of you and hanging on tight. <laughs> and it's to, I think Bobby said it at the beginning, is like, and this is so true, is that the paradox of this business is that we invest in people that by definition don't need us. Yeah. And that's something you have to understand. So if I were to make a blanket statement about VC, which is very dangerous, you have to understand that you can't generalize this industry when the business is about trying to identify the unicorn before anybody else does. Mm -hmm. It's very hard business. If we've proven anything as an industry, it's that we've, we've learned to lose money very well. Capturing lightning in a bottle is a hard thing to do. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a scary business to be in. Yeah. For real. Yeah. I want to build on that point about innovating in the middle, you know, because I think that's the biggest problem in the region is, you know, the market's opened up and Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I'll tell you what, I, what I'm what i doing, which is, so, so um, for those of you who don't know, uh, when I came back from, so I grew up in Great Falls, I moved to Silicon Valley in 2008, and then came back last year, um, and kind of sort of took over Crystal City, um, which we're kind of trying to rename Sing City now, but... Um, <laughs> Was that Sin City? Sing, Sing City, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, now, that being said, that being said, um, look, you know, the number one question I get from my LPs is, well, hang on a minute, are you geographically focused? Because I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm losing money everywhere else. I need you to make money. And so one of the things we have to be very careful about when we talk to our LPs is we say, listen, um, we will invest in the best companies regardless of location, uh, regardless of country. I've invested in 40 countries now. Um, but we hope, um, and we hope that some of them are in our backyard. I think the duty of trying to keep the entrepreneurs here cannot be the investors. Yeah, I mean, investors are a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. Correct. Money Correct. follows opportunity. It doesn't create opportunity. Correct. That's absolutely right. right. I agree, but I mean, what are the things we can do in terms of doing the Build great companies. Yeah, be good. Be, be, that, that's the, it's, it's, you know, the sad thing is, is that the answer is simple, but the answer is hard. But fostering that leadership and building those public private hey. We, well, people have been fostering this thing for, we've, we've been fostering, this is like, I mean, I've been here since 98, fostering. We've been fostering, we do. Paul fosters, we all foster, 
But there's no, I'll tell you, I've been here since 98, fostering. I mean, Ann Rosenblum's over here someplace, at least she was, Fairfax County EDA, Dan Gonzalez. I mean, there are people here who've been fostering, TN, fostering forever. The reality is, is that in a national market, because what we're describing is a national market, you've got Bobby Ocampo getting on airplanes, going to deals out there. It's not a failure of the investment capital. Ultimately, it's up to our entrepreneurs. We have to build great companies. Yeah, I think if, you, if you're looking for a tactic, though, the controversial one, to be honest, is curation. That's yeah. what we need, is we need more curation. Yeah, no lake will be gone. Yeah. Here, here's the thing, like, let's just, if, the controversial point that you have to really understand is that, like, you won't see, the, like, the CEO of Living Social sitting here. Why is that? It's not because he's busy. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. It's because he's probably already curated a network of people that he wants to hang out with. Here's what I would say is that for those of you that are on the economic development side, like, when we're, to be honest, like, what, the way that we've built Crystal City now, is that there are sections of those blocks. There's a section where the venture-funded companies hang out. There's a section on the other side of the block for the makers. There's a section where we're installing WeWork in this big dorm-style unit. In the center where the restaurants are, the collisions, but they need to be curated because a venture-style company must be near another venture-style company. They can't be near the makers, who are still doing important things, but very different business models, yeah. things like that. So, you know, I just, I would say, if you're doing anything, whether it's at the school level, at the economic development level, whatever, identify quickly whether you've got, you know, just use the best effort you got, venture funded versus, you know, uh, lifestyle business versus service business, and just keep them together, right? Another uh, way to describe it is, you're judging this world by whose company you keep. Well, there's research that says you are the average of the six people around you in terms of salary, in terms of character, in terms of, I mean, almost every metric. The research suggests that it's the six around you, six companies, six people, six everything. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yes, Jeff. A little bit of a different direction. Can you guys tell me what your impression of the accelerator space as it relates to what you point of I, I, I built one. <laughs> so I guess Awful business. Favorite. I know that. Yeah. Uh, let me put it into context. When, when, so I, I was a co-founder of a firm called 500 Startups which most people don't realize was started here. Uh, we were both from here, I was from Great Falls and Dave was from Columbia, Maryland. And um, uh, we met on a shitty little bar in K Street and the floor, feet were sticking to the floor. But anyway, here's the thing. Back then, there were really only three, three accelerators that mattered. This is 2010, not very long ago. Y Combinator, 500 startups, and Techstars. Today, on AngelList, there are over 2,000. It's tricky. Because, you know, the hard question that nobody wants to ask, everybody wants to start an accelerator, but the hard question nobody wants to ask or answer is that in a power law driven world, you know, what, what, what Jake mentioned, in a power law driven world where the few companies will return all the job creation, all the money, all the revenue, all the taxable income, everything, why would they go to a local accelerator if they got the opportunity to go to a national one? Or why even go to one if they're doing really well? Especially now that all the information's transparent. I wouldn't want to run an accelerator. I no. mean, it's hard work. It's tough. I mean, you, you, we've seen a few of them. I haven't been here that long, but you, you, you're fronting the burn for all of these companies that are sitting in your office. Yep. You, one of them, ha like a couple of them, have to do really well really fast. Because you're in, I mean, in the end, all of this is going to come down to money. Yeah. So when this market, if it goes down a little bit or comes back or whatever, I'd be curious to see through all Paul's data he's collected, um, where everyone is, where all these angel funds are, are where, where all these people are investing in angelist companies or all these accelerators or whatever. Because in the end, it's going to come down to, did you return 5, 10x for me? Yeah. Or did you, is all this paper value that is made up on some series A fund that wrote it up for you and you're not going to get an exit in 10 years, right? So, yeah, I mean, that's all true. I mean, you look at uh, Jonathan uh, Pirelli with, with the Fort, where, you know, Jonathan's great, great. great guy. Yeah, he's invested and, a couple and, of great companies, right? And, but, but now he's got to wait for them to monetize. It's money. It'll be, it's it's money. I mean, the problem yeah. is it's seven years before you get an M&A exit. Totally. But, but wait a minute. The one thing I would say uh, is, and, and is that ultimately there are 2,000 accelerators, most of them undifferentiated nonsense. I mean, they're just, they're just People that could basically, oh, I want to be a VC, how do I become a VC? Oh, I raise $500,000 and I dole it out at 8% of the company. But the ones that are successful, what they all have in common is they have a, a differentiable ecosystem where they're creating something that's valuable. And it can be like Y Combinator where it's in the valley and it just, it's the best of the best. Uh, I mean, Jeff, what, what you're doing with Conscious Capital, that's a differentiated model, Mach 37 differentiated model. I think 
that the interesting question is whether or not three or five years from now there will be an enough success to demonstrate the differentiated model makes sense and we have 50 or 100 that are successful in the well, country. I think, I think accelerate, so just off the record, don't tweet this. Good Look, luck. 500 okay. Startups still runs its accelerators. And we run them, frankly, for two reasons. Number one, even though we lose money, we run them for two reasons. Number one, we get a lot of free marketing out of it. So much press out of that thing, it is killer. We couldn't pay for that kind of press. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, is we invest in so many international companies that accelerators are a great way to introduce them to the United States. That's it, mm -hmm. right? If you look right now, you won't see very many American companies sitting in our accelerators. Now, that being said, accelerators aren't all bad. It's just their business models are built like VC firms. And mm -hmm. to Bobby's point, that does not work. Right. I will assert, actually, before I even make this assertion, I want to point out the DC language of that he's a good guy is like the equivalent of the southern uh, 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 euphemism of bless your heart. That's what I'm just going to say. <laughs> oh, no, no. I like uh, Pirelli. I, I, I'm not saying about Pirelli. I'm just saying. I was just making a point. Yeah. It was irrelevant just yeah. to say it. Anyway, That's nice. Um, but that being said, um, that being said, uh, here's what I would say. You know, I think the, the biggest thing that's going to happen in our lifetime that we don't really think about is that technology is con continuing to uh, drive jobs Kill jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just assert that the biggest change in our lifetime will be the massive retraining of, of, of U.S. citizens into different industries, right? And maybe, just maybe, that will become the responsibility of some of these accelerators who may or may not be funded by economic development units. It may even fall on the universities. The, the cleaner way for me to say it is, if the last 10 and 20 years uh, was about teaching people how to use technology to build big companies, then I will assert that the next 20 years is about teaching people how to navigate technology and understand it well enough that they can understand how it will change the existing industries. I, I want to jump in on this question of accelerators. What Are they good? Are they bad? Or whatever. I, I was reflecting on, I hate to say this, I was in business school almost 30 years ago. <laughs> and. Uh, and we did a, a, a case study on were accelerators a good idea. Uh, we, they weren't called accelerators then, they were called incubators. And, and the general consensus was they really weren't a good idea. Uh, to what Bobby said, if, if someone's doing really well, they don't need one. Mm -hmm. But they were rare 30 years ago. Today, they're everywhere. And so to me, the question is, this proliferation of entrepreneurial activity that is unprecedented in my judgment. And the number of people who are graduating from college or just a couple years out of college believe they're prepared and ready to start their own business. It's a unreal phenomenon, which I don't think, again, we know the answer to what it means. Yeah. Other than there are so many more entrepreneurs today, I think, than there were 30 years ago, 20 years ago. and. And their basis of experience will be as entrepreneurs, not I worked at McKinsey or I worked at IBM and now it's my time. It's I'm an entrepreneur from the beginning to the end. And what will that lead to? I don't really yeah. know. Yeah. Well, not everybody needs to be a founder, but everybody does have to be an entrepreneur. Look, I'll yeah. tell you what. I, I teach entrepreneurship in Maryland. And, and my viewpoint is that for the millennials and the Gen Xs, they need to be entrepreneurial, whatever they do, because we are growing. The internet and additive manufacturing and artificial intelligence and all this other stuff is going to drive, you know, basically any, any job that just requires brute force, humans aren't going to be doing in 20 years. Unless we teach people how to be creative, unless we teach them how to take advantage of what humans are good at, which is pattern recognition and creativity, we're going to end up with this basically an underemployed underclass. And that's going to be terrible for our democracy. But Congress is going to fix it. <laughs> Can we end on a positive note, please? Uh, I just want Congress will definitely fix it. <laughs> well, we're so, kind of out of time right now, so I'd love to thank Jonathan, Bobby, Jake, Jason, and Paul. So let's give it up. Thank you.